Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Hanley, and I'm the senior partner in Wilson Solicitors. It is my very great privilege to welcome you all here tonight for the inaugural K. Everett Memorial Lecture and prize-giving ceremony. We will shortly be commencing our evening with the prize presentation to be followed by a lecture delivered by Martha Spurrier, Director of Liberty. There will be an opportunity for questions and comments and the formal part of the evening will be concluded uh, with closing remarks by Professor Carol Tan, head of the SOAS School of Law. The formal part of the evening will be followed by a drinks reception in the Brunei suite upstairs at street level. And we very much hope that you'll all be able to join us uh, for that part of the evening. Uh, we would particularly like any student uh, guests to come and join that uh, gathering. We believe greatly that we can benefit from academic students and practicing lawyers mingling. We have established a series of lectures in Kay's memory which will take place annually over the coming years. The memorial event will have an associated prize which will be, avail which will be awarded to the very best dissertation in a SOAS master's module um, course of study uh, with a human rights aspect. I believe that there are in the region of 100 dissertations eligible for the award, which is a very significant body of study on uh, human rights. The Memorial Prize is awarded to the dissertation with the very highest academic mark finalised by the Postgraduate Board of Examiners. Kay herself believed in training the next generation. She was a superb mentor, patient and generous with her knowledge and experience. She had a special bond with her trainee solicitors and her caseworkers. I remember her remarking at one time, uh, quite late in her illness, Michael, I just want to get back to carry on bossing my trainees around. And um, that feeling, I'm sure, was very much reciprocated. And I know that uh, the people who were fortunate enough to be trained by Kay hold her in particularly high regard. I'm sure that Kay would very much have approved of an award designed to encourage and inspire students at the early stages of their career. I would very much like to thank SOAS for their co collaboration uh, and enormous support in bringing the Kay Everett Memorial event to fruition. Kay was a student at SOAS in 2004 where she did an LLM in international human rights law and her master's studies at SOAS were a very important part in her transition from a commercial solicitor in practice in the city to the passionate humans, human rights work that she undertook uh, in various organisations, but ultimately uh, from 2008 in Wilson Solicitors. Kay became a partner in 2012 and she made a fantastic contribution to our firm. With her boundless enthusiasm, inventive legal thinking, and absolute empathy with the work that we all do. It was an enormous sadness for the entire firm and for the wider community of immigration activists when Kay passed away in 2016, succumbing to a hard fought battle with cancer at the very young age of only 43. So our memorial evening is in recognition and sincere appreciation 
of Kay's contribution to the practice of immigration law. I'm sure that the memorial lectures over the years will stimulate thought and reflection and indeed action in the field of human rights and especially refugee and migrant rights. I'm particularly pleased that Kay's father has been able to join us this evening. Brian has travelled particularly to the UK uh, for this event. And Brian, you are extremely welcome. Kay's partner, Anand, is now uh, going to make the presentation to the very first prize winner, Edda Sehan. So I would like to call on Anand to make the presentation. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Michael. So Kay really enjoyed her time at SOAS studying for her master's in international human rights. She found it a particularly exciting place to study given its focus on an area of the world which was very important to her. She also worked hard as she was a mature student and it was part of her journey from the city to immigration and public law. Those of you who knew Kay will not be surprised to know that she set up a study group with like-minded, hard-working students to ensure they were disciplined and progressed <laughs> when she was at SOAS. I'm sure that she and her study group would have competed hard to win this prize had it been available back then. And we're very grateful to SOAS and Michael and his colleagues at Wilson's for arranging such a fitting way to remember Kay. Given this, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate Edda on winning the inaugural Kay Everett Memorial Prize for the best human rights dissertation on a SOAS Masters. Edda has made a similar journey to that which Kay took from the city, and her dissertation considers the new temporary exclusion orders and reminds us that it's sometimes necessary to challenge the very premise of new legislative measures which are proposed rather than only critiquing them from a human rights perspective. Given the continuing, never-ending proposals for further counter-terrorism legislation, I'm sure this approach is going to be one that continues to be both relevant and important. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Edda here. To Enormous congratulations, Edda. Challenging unlawful detention and securing bail was at the heart of Kay's practice and a most important work, uh, aspect of our work. Kay was involved in establishing our public law, co-establishing with James Ed Elliott, our public law department in 2012. She shared a passionate commitment to exposing justice, injustice, exposing injustice by bringing cases, and it was her day-to-day -day work as a lawyer that underpin, uh, very much underpinned her authority to speak out on behalf of the voiceless, which is nearly me. <laughs> <laughs> the indefinite, indefinite detention of immigrants is simply an outrage. It is unacceptable. It's a stain on our civil liberties, as is the endemic level of migrant detention running at something like 27,000 people a year. Unlike a custodial sentence where the prisoner counts down the days to generally known release dates, an immigration detainee counts the days upwards, never knowing when he or she will be released. It is extremely fitting that Kay's first memorial lecture 
has the title, It's About Time, Ending the Tragedy of Indefinite Immigration Detention. So without further ado, I have the enormous pleasure of calling on Martha Spurrier, Director of Liberty, to deliver the inaugural K. Everett Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it's a real honour, like a real honour, to be giving this lecture tonight. Kay was a really inspirational lawyer, an inspirational campaigner, and I think one of the things I've been thinking about when thinking about this evening is how it's incumbent on all of us to reflect how we can aspire to be more like her, to be held accountable to her ideals, and to carry on the very important work that she did and that I know so many of you in this room do. So as Michael has said tonight, I want to reflect on something that Kay and I shared um, and that I expect many of you share, and that is a very deep sadness and a really profound anger about the practice in this country of locking up migrants indefinitely. It is, to my mind, a practice that is the worst human rights abuse that happens on these shores. And the fact that it is done in our names every day belittles all of us. But before getting on to, to detention, um, I just wanted to pause and think a little bit about lawyers, um, or think about lawyers like Kay. Because lawyers are not really known for their humility, and barristers perhaps particularly. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but actually, I think that the very best lawyers are truly humble people. I think that they are lawyers who, like Kay, and like many of you, know that but for the grace of whatever higher power you believe in, if anyone, we're all the same as our clients. And it's only accidents of circumstance that separate us, and that we are not superior and we are not important, and that it's not about the lawyer. It's never about the lawyer. The lawyer is not the important one. And of course, not that far from here stands the burnt out remains of Grenfell Tower, which I think for all of us is this very dark icon of the injustices and the inequalities that still run pretty deep in this first world country. And I think it's a tragic reminder, if you've been past that tower, if you've driven past it on the West Way, it's a tragic reminder that even those very basic rights still have to be fought for. And it's a monument, really, to what happens when rights are disregarded, but perhaps, you know, in less legalistic language, when human life is treated cheaply. And I think we would do very well to remember every day that we are not so different from those people and that you might have a different life to me or hold a different passport or speak a different language or pray to a different God, but pretty much our hopes and our fears are one. Like everyone who lives in a tower block, we want to sleep safely in our beds, we want our families to be protected, we want to be free to protest and resist and dissent. And I think the best lawyers, lawyers like Kay, really know this. I think they know that they're not very far from being the survivor of the fire or the immigration detainee. And that that distance between them and their clients is something to feel profoundly grateful for, profoundly conscious of. And that it's about being aware that it's that distance that enables us as lawyers to try and do something about the injustice or the intolerance or the abuse that many of our clients will have faced. And so tonight, as we spend a bit of time thinking about immigration detention and the enormity of what we're doing to people in those removal centres, I think we have a bit of an obligation to feel optimistic about it. We have a bit of an obligation to feel like we get to still be here 
and we get to carry on this fight. It's a real privilege to do this kind of work, and I think if we can keep at it, and if we can keep hopeful and keep hold of our humility, then we will be able to do something that Kay would be proud of, that will genuinely make a difference, and that in the process of being part of that will make all of our lives richer. There's a brilliant quote, I'm not going to go down kind of literary ways, but there's a great quote from my literary hero, who's a man called David Foster Wallace, um, and he wrote beautifully about the nature of freedom. And he said, there are all different kinds of freedom, and the kind that is most precious you will not hear much talked about in the great outside world of winning and achieving and displaying. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, little, unsexy ways every day. That is real freedom. And that, I think, is the freedom that we should all be aspiring to, to caring about other people, sacrificing for other people in myriad ways every day, just like legal aid lawyers do all the time. And to my mind, caring about people in detention, sacrificing something for them, is a pretty noble place to start. So I don't imagine that there's anyone in this room who doesn't know what immigration detention is. Although one of the really striking things for me over the past couple of years of doing my job at Liberty has been the number of people who have no idea what immigration detention is. And not, not because they're ignorant or apathetic people, but because you can be a pretty right-thinking, engaged person and you can still not know very much about this quite well-kept secret that is behind high walls and razor wire. And of course, there's a context to everything and there's a reason why sometimes some secrets are easier to keep. And I think it's worth standing back and reflecting on how we treat our migrants generally, not just what we're doing in those detention centres. It was once said that you should judge a society by how it treats its prisoners. I actually think now in 2018, we should also be judged by how we treat our immigrants and I think we would be judged harshly. In the UK, we're one of the only countries in Europe that doesn't have a written strategy on refugee integration. You'll remember, it was a, a while ago now, but you'll remember that during the refugee crisis, the rhetoric used by politicians was pretty astonishingly poisonous. Those people who were, of course, seeking sanctuary were refer referred to as floods and swarms and invasions. So much so that the UN felt compelled to intervene, condemning our politicians as xenophobic and calling out grossly excessive language. And of course, under David Cameron and continuing under Theresa May, although I don't think any of us are na naive enough to think that this kind of policy is the prevail of only one political party, but under David Cameron and continuing under Theresa May, the Conservative Party has introduced a whole raft of policies, again, no doubt familiar to many of you, that are designed to criminalise and penalise and isolate migrants. And those measures are far-reaching. You know, there's a group in Parliament that meets regularly, and they're from all different departments. And the point of their meeting is to think of new and creative ways that they can make life for migrants really difficult in this country. And so we've seen measures making it a criminal offence to drive a car if you're an undocumented migrant, making it an offence if you don't declare your nationality on arrest, making it a requirement that you declare your nationality at the outset of your criminal trial, stopping undocumented migrants from renting properties and opening bank accounts, orders used to prohibit rough sleeping and what's often called aggressive begging, whatever that means, swinging cuts to asylum support for those applying for refugee status, and of course, not so long ago, those deeply offensive go-home vans patrolling the streets of London. And many of these measures have seen ordinary citizens co-opted as border guards. We have seen bankers and landlords and nurses and midwives and teachers forced into being complicit in an agenda that puts immigration control above everything, that brings the border in country, 
makes life miserable for migrants here and tries to send the signal to the rest of the world that you very much shouldn't try and come to this country, notwithstanding that, of course, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. The government's name for this suite of policies is the hostile environment policy. And again, all of you will remember that after the EU referendum, there was a really frightening spike in hate crime. It rose by about 187%. That spike is part of an even more depressing story, in a way, I promise you this whole talk is not just going to be really depressing, but, you know, there's an arc, which... Um, so, it's, that spike is part of a pretty depressing narrative, which has seen year-on-year year growth in hate crime. And overwhelmingly after the referendum, the hate crimes were racially motivated hate crimes. Now, we don't know whether they were xenophobic hate crimes. We don't record that as separate. But we can assume, given what was happening at the time, that probably lots of that hate crime was motivi motivated by assumptions about where people were from and whether they had a right to be here. One thing that struck me when that was happening, you, you may remember, eventually Amber Rudd had to make a statement because this hate crime was ballooning in our communities. And she, in her statement, condemned, and I quote, the climate of hostility towards migrants on our streets. And I read that and reflected on her choice of language and thought to myself, you know, you reap what you sow. Because language and policy making, that rhetoric, that hostile environment at the very top on some level, even if it's subconscious, gives license to some people to act out on their worst prejudices. And I think perhaps one of the most distressing examples of this in recent months, which seemed to break through a bit into the public consciousness, was the woman who reported a rape and then was arrested at a refuge for an immigration offence and taken to a detention centre. And as a woman, as a feminist, as a human being, as a taxpayer who's supposed to have policing by consent, I was utterly appalled by that. It's not the kind of policing that I want done in my name. I don't want immigration offences taking priority over serious sexual offences. And I feel pretty sickened by the hypocrisy of a Home Secretary and a Prime Minister who love nothing more than to talk about their commitment to the modern slavery agenda. And yet, of course, if women can't come forward and report crimes, knowing, of course, that many of those women, if they have been trafficked here, will have unsettled immigration status, if they can't have a pathway to justice and accountability, then that agenda is completely hollow. I touch on those things because I do think it's an important and illuminating context for immigration detention. Because in one way, immigration detention is the very hardest edge of all of those attitudes, of all of those policies. I think if we didn't have those attitudes and we didn't have those policies, I'm not sure we would tolerate detention as we do every day. When I first started working as a barrister, I did bail applications for, for BID, the wonderful charity that provides pro bono support um, for detainees who are applying for bail in the tribunal. And, you know, Everyone will have a story like mine. I have no ownership over this story because it is so ubiquitous. But I represented a man in a bail hearing um, who had been detained for over three years. And he'd gone into detention healthy. And again, you know, a tale as old as time. He, over that time, detention had destroyed his mental health. And we, you know, I wrote this kind of detailed skeleton argument and felt I think it really was the first time I felt very passionately that there was a real injustice happening and that I really wanted to put an end to it but also felt that I knew that if on that day bail wasn't granted a little bit of my faith in the system would fall away and would be pretty hard to restore um, and he didn't get bail and he didn't get bail because he didn't have a surety um, so no one was there to put money up to guarantee that he wouldn't abscond um, and it was the first time, not the last time in these hearings, but it was the first time that I could not hold back the tears in the courtroom. I couldn't get out of the room before I started crying. And a barrister outside court, who I now know is Alison Pickup, who I then became a much-loved colleague at Doughty Street, but outside court came over to me and said, have you just been doing a bail hearing? I said, yes. Um, 
and you know, she knew the story. She'd done the bail hearings. She knew I didn't have to go through the sob story for her to understand that sense of injustice. So she sort of gave me tissues and bought me a cup of tea and sent me on my way. Um, but it's astonishing to me that that story is so mundane. I practiced as a lawyer, you know, across a range of areas, and I came across a lot of injustice. You know, I did inquests into deaths in custody, actions against the police, a whole range of bad news stories. And no question, there was some pretty shocking stuff, but there was nothing I ever did, nothing I ever did, where I came across systemically real abuses of power, real injustice, and something that fundamentally felt like it was the creature of a really broken, immoral system, as when I was doing immigration detention cases. So, as Michael said, last year, 27,000 people locked up in these removal centres. And, of course, so important to be really clear that these people are not serving sentences of imprisonment. They are not there because they have committed a crime. And their detention is at the whim of the executive. It's not been authorised by a judge. Um, many of them will never see the inside of a courtroom. And so they're held there, all 27,000 of them, for the administrative convenience of the Home Office. And they, of course, include pregnant women and victims of trafficking and torture and people with serious mental and physical health problems or who develop those health problems because of detention. They include children, contrary to the promise to stop detaining children. They include families. They include people seeking or people who have sought asylum. In fact, that's the biggest group of people that find themselves in detention. And I had a striking moment um, whenever it was that there was a protest outside Downing Street about um, the Muslim ban, Trump's Muslim ban, when Theresa May had gone on her visit and been slow to condemn it. And I was walking... Oh, actually, I wasn't going to the protest, which is terrible. <laughs> but I was walking in the direction of the protest, and I ended up walking along with a couple who were headed there. And they were saying, it's so outrageous um, that Donald Trump is detaining migrants outside airports. I mean, it's just... I can't believe... And they were, you know, very genuinely and authentically horrified by what they had been reading about, you know, lawyers sitting in airports writing pleadings to get these people out of detention. And these were two British people, and I said, you know, we've been doing that here for years, 27,000 people a year detained not far from airports because of the Home Office. And they had no idea. And, you know, those conversations can be useful because they illuminate in that moment a reason for that person to feel a bit more activist about what's going on in their home country and not just about what's going on in the States. But it's an indication that we have some way to go in spreading the word about this practice. One of the optimistic things um, is that in recent years, unannounced inspections and investigative journalism has started to lift the lid on these detention centres. And we have seen that the most basic standards of dignity and safety and respect are very often denied these detainees. There have been many instances of unlawful and sometimes fatal restraint, denial of essential medical treatment, and, of course, allegations of pretty horrendous physical and sexual abuse, and the sexual abuse particularly at Yarlswood, where the women are currently on hunger strike. The UNHCR has criticised the detention estate. The HM Inspector of Prison, Prisons has criticised the detention estate. The Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration has criticised the detention estate. And you may remember that the government, a couple of years ago now, commissioned Stephen Shaw to do a review of vulnerable people in detention, and he's doing a second one. It'll come out probably in June or July of this year. And the government's own reviewer found that detention was a dehumanising process which undermines welfare and contributes to vulnerability. Last year, in September, a Panorama documentary revealed the true scale of mistreatment and hopelessness at Brook House. And if anyone does this work, you probably will have done a lot of work about Brook House because it is very often where people go when they are at their most ill and when they have been detained for the most long. It's the place where E-Wing exists, and E-Wing is, is a solitary confinement wing, um, but it's used, so if you are you know, acting out, then you go onto E-Wing as a punishment. If you are floridly mentally unwell and you need reassurance and safety, you go onto E-Wing to the same cell, but you have a little pot plant in the corner of the room. Um, in the wake of the Panorama documentary, six G4S staff members were sacked immediately. 
um, and the Home Affairs, Parliament's Home Affairs Select Committee began an inquiry into the scandal. I think if you had one of those undercover programmes really at any detention centre, you would uncover similar levels of abuse. In 2017 alone, reports suggest that 10 people died in immigration detention. Most of them were taking their own lives. I say reports suggest because I was involved in a case, in fact the last case I did before I moved to Liberty, where basically the Home Office tried to cover up a death in detention. They lifted their detention powers about half an hour before a person died while shackled and having open heart surgery. Um, on the basis of that, they said there was no need for an independent investigation into this man's death. They'd done their own internal investigation, but they were saying they were refusing to release it on the basis that it would be too upsetting for the family to read. So 10 people that we know of died in immigration detention last year. And again, as many of you will know, since 2010, there have been six cases where the courts have found a violation of Article 3 of the European Convention. And people aren't lawyers in the room. Article 3 is pretty much the biggest one, perhaps only after Article 2, about not taking life. It's the right not to be tortured and treated in a way that is inhuman and degrading. Um, it's, you can't violate that right. Um, those are the reported cases. And you can go away and read them, and they're shocking. But anyone who has worked in this area will have settled many cases where the facts are worse than those ones, because those are the cases that the government thought they could win. That's why they fight them. And I don't know how many Article 3 cases have been settled. I did many. There was a time when I was probably settling one or two a month, where the Article 3 breaches were so clear and so egregious that the government had no option other than to write a pretty substantial cheque, which of course always came with a pretty strict confidentiality agreement. But what it does mean is that we can safely assume that the very worst cases of the very worst abuse are things that will never see the light of day because the Home Office will never let them inside a courtroom. And what I really believe, and it comes back to what I was saying about, you know, having done these other areas of work and this just not happening on the same level, I really believe that there is no other context where we would tolerate repeated public findings of violations of Article 3. It doesn't happen in police cells. Now and again, you will get a shocking case. I don't want to belittle some of those cases. Now and again, you will. Now and again in psychiatric care. Now and again in prison. But there is no equivalent of a fairly regular annual finding of these Article 3 breaches. And I do think we have to ask the question of why it is, as a society, in that context, the context that concerns only migrants, we are in some way content for those abuses to continue. I think that it must be connected to a climate of xenophobia that is connected to the hostile environment and is connected to the rhetoric and is connect connected to the way that politics about immigration has unfolded. As I say, you can read those cases and you know, they will depress you and inspire you to work on these issues. Um, but there's also something about the way that the government defends these cases, which I think speaks to an attitude which, again, you don't see. And, you know, I'm a claimant lawyer. I saw some pretty crappy arguments from the government in lots of different contexts. But there's a case called HA, which is one of the Article 3 cases. Um, not my case, but they... This man, HA, was Nigerian. He was very, very, very sick indeed. And he was kind of in the revolving door between psychiatric care and detention. In and out, in and out. Um, and... You know, again, you read the facts of the case. He used to lie with his eyes rolled back in his head because he was so unwell, in a kind of floridly psychotic state, naked. He'd pull his mattress onto the floor of his room and just lie there. He wouldn't eat, wouldn't drink, except for now and again when he would drink from the toilet in his room. And this was being give as, given as an example by his lawyers in the hearing in front of Mr Justice Singh of how sick he was and how the failure to transfer him out of detention and to hospital had been a breach of his Article 3 rights, which was eventually the finding. And um, Julie Anderson, who's a senior... Yeah, well... She's a senior barrister, right? Senior barrister for the... For, well, senior barrister who acts for the Home Office. Um, instructed on all of these cases. And, you know, we laugh because... Sometimes she, she's not the most effective lawyer, but in that case, and I, you know, I really name her and shame her because she deserves it for this. In that case, she made a submission 
that the reason that HA was drinking from the toilet bowl was because in Nigeria, people love the idea of such fresh water. That in Nigeria, people urinate and defecate in the water of the river where they also drink and wash their clothes and wash their food and get their cooking water. And so when you come to the UK and you're Nigerian, of course you're going to get down on your knees and drink from the toilet. And, you know, that submission, very wisely, Bat Murphy got the transcript of that hearing. It didn't make it into the judgment, but they got the transcript of that hearing so that we would remember that that submission was made in the Home Office's name at the RCJ, not very far from here. It's a racist submission. It's one that the government should be ashamed to have ever had made in its name. But again, it's something that, you know, Rabinda Singh didn't like it. They lost the case. But that's, there's no national outcry that that's what the government is saying in these cases. The futility of the whole system is also chillingly clear. So, again, as you may know, many people in detention are not returned to their home country. The, the, the beginning of detention as an idea was it's going to be a short-term holding facility. We still have those, but it's going to be a short-term holding facility so that you can get someone on a plane. Put them in one place near Gatwick, get them on a plane, get them home. And lots of people would agree with that as an idea. I'm not saying that I agree with it, but I think lots of people would. And of course, it's then ballooned into this whole estate. And last year, more people were released from detention back into the community than were deported. That fact alone tells you this is a system that is simply not working. As at December 2017, the longest period of time a person had served in detention and of course this is not counting the people before who had served many years in detention, was 1,698 days, that's over four and a half years. And there are people who serve shorter sentences for rape. Last year, 2,000 people detained for more than four months, 200 for over a year, and 28 people for more than two years. In November last year, in this is kind of building to the point that I want to make, which is that there is a bit of a groundswell here. You know, we may not be reading about this on the front pages of the papers every day, but actually the tide, I really think, is turning. So in November last year, you may have seen that the Bar Council, you know, not necessarily a kind of radical body, but the Bar Council produced a report making it absolutely clear that people are held in immigration detention for too long, that they do not have adequate access to justice, and that they need more legal help. Amnesty research published in January confirmed that decisions to detain are very often based on mistakes and on flawed reasoning and that the assumption is to detain rather than, of course, the presumption being to release. And I mentioned the Bar Council, I mentioned Amnesty because I think for a long time, and this critique can be levelled at liberty as well, for a long time this issue was seen as the prevail of the migrants' rights sector and it wasn't seen as a mainstream human rights issue. And I do think when you have the Bar Council weighing in, we've seen in the last few months the BMA, the British Medical Association, weighing in. Amnesty is weighing in. Liberty, I'm glad to say, is weighing in. I do think that we are starting to see people rec recognising that this is a human rights issue. It's not a migrants' rights issue, it's a human rights issue. The other thing that I think it's important to be really clear about is that immigration detention in this country is indefinite. And I say that because, again, in this room, you probably say that all the time. And the reason it's indefinite is because there's no time limit. So the campaign is and has always been for a time limit on immigration detention of 28 days. And we are the only country in Europe that doesn't put a time limit on its detention of migrants. And, you know, as Michael really powerfully said, people in prison count down and people in immigration detention count up. The government in the last two months or so, has started to deny that we have indefinite immigration detention in this country. So much so that, you know, you start questioning your own sanity. And so I went back to basics and looked up the word indefinite in the Oxford English Dictionary and found that, as I had suspected, synonyms for the word indefinite include unknown, indeterminate, unspecified, unlimited, unrestricted, undefined, unfixed. All words that, of course, perfectly accurately describe the length of detention in the UK. But, like I say, over the past few months, 
no doubt, and hopefully because they are getting wind of the fact that there is a growing movement for change in this area, the government has started to deny indefinite detention. And so Amber Rudd, for example, wrote to Andrew Mitchell after he had asked if he could go and visit Brooke House and said in it, I note you have included your article, he wrote an article for Conservative Home, I note that you've included your article on detention policy in your correspondence, specifically highlighting the fact we have no time limit on detention, which I read with interest. As you will be aware, it is not possible to detain a person indefinitely in the UK. Detention must last no longer than is necessary. <laughs> Days later, on Question Time, just last week, Brandon Lewis, who is an immigration minister, said the same thing. We don't have indefinite detention in this country. Amber Rudd said the same thing on Tuesday in the House of Commons. And then... On Wednesday, we had Lady Williams, who was leading for the Tories in a debate that Brian Paddock had started in the Lords um, this week on immigration detention. He was raising, among other things, the issue of the hunger strike in Yarlswood. And Lady Williams replied to Paddock when he said, we have indefinite immigration detention, uh, saying, it is quite fair to say most people in detention, 92%, that's not actually correct, um, do not stay in detention for more than four months. So the notion that someone might be detained indefinitely is simply not there. And then she went on to say, the reason for detention is for the purposes of removal, it is not to detain indefinitely. So in quite an extraordinary way, we are seeing this sort of double speak, double think, um, about indefinite detention. We've never seen it before. It's a, it's a sort of new bit of rhetoric that they've come up with and obviously feel quite like it's quite clever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's good in the sense that if it's a sign that they're on the run, then that's good. It's bad in the sense that this is unacceptable. You know, th these are people whose humanity has completely deserted them if they are resor resorting to this kind of politics. Lady Williams, in that debate, went on to say about the women in Yarlswood, that um, there were many reasons why you might refuse to eat. And those would include dietary and religious reasons. And again, you know, you read that in Hansard and you just think this is an unforgivable way to speak about people and about their dignity and about their liberty. Of course, again, as you will know, there are plenty of alternatives to immigration detention. Detention Action have done amazing work looking at alternative models in Sweden, where, of course, because it does seem to be some sort of utopia, um, <laughs> they have managed to create systems for case management in the community, which lead to higher rates of voluntary return, perhaps unsurprisingly because people feel like they can trust the system and have faith in the system and participate in the system, unlike here where it is based on coercion and control and aggressive enforcement, which alienates people and forces them underground. But as I say, while you would be forgiven for thinking that this is all pretty bleak and pretty enormous and pessimistic, I really do stand here optimistic about this issue. I think momentum is gathering, and I think people are starting to wrap their heads around the fact that this is a human rights issue, that if you care about any human rights issue, you have to care about this one. One of the things that really struck me, and I talked about this in my job interview for the, for the Liberty Job, was, and again, I think, it, you know, I, I do think it speaks to this context of how we think about immigrants. One of Liberty's great campaign successes um, was the stopping of the Labour government proposal to detain terror suspects without charge for 90 days. And they worked with David Davis, with Andrew Mitchell, with the sort of civil libertarian part of the Conservative Party who were then in opposition, and they successfully managed to stop this, no question, pernicious proposal. And I reflected later that it was interesting to me that no one then thought to join the dots and say, well, why, if it's not okay for terror suspects, why, why do we, I mean, you know, there's a time sometimes where you'd give your right arm for 90 days in immigration detention. And why aren't we connecting these two things? And why aren't we just deploying the same arguments that we used over there, that we managed to persuade people who are not often on our side, managed to persuade them of terror suspects, you know, a tough crowd. Why did we not just read across and run those same arguments? And of course, at that time, one of the big arguments that 
some people in politics and some people in the police and the security services were running was 90 days is needed because 28 days, 14 days is not long enough to do our job. We have to be able to investigate. And we need that time to be able to investigate properly and put together everything that we need to be able to charge someone. And if we release these people onto the streets, God knows what they'll go on to do, but we know that it will be terrible. And fundamentally, that argument just got debunked. And the response was, it's too great an infringement of civil liberties. Do your job better and do it faster. And sure enough, since then, what we actually don't see, you know, we do see some of these policies rearing their heads and... You know, as Anan said, there's a voracious appetite for counter-terror law in this country. But actually, we don't often credibly see people saying we would be preventing these terror attacks if only we had 90-day detention. Because we have understood that actually in 14 days and extendable to 28 if they need it, the police can do their job in that time. The Home Office, of course, when confronted with the suggestion that there might be a 28-day time limit on detention, say well, we can't possibly get our act together to deport someone in 28 days. And if we had to release them, I mean, these are nasty people. Who knows what could happen in our communities? It's not good enough. It's the same argument that was run before. It didn't work then, and it shouldn't work again now. And my real hope is that just like with 90 days, we will eventually get to a place where we will remember when those arguments were run, we will remember how tired and unpersuasive they were, and we'll be glad that we've seen the back of them. And I think... Generally speaking, from where I'm standing, we have seen some real hopeful green shoots of activism, particularly since the referendum. We have seen so many people signing petitions, joining protests, joining liberty, joining amnesty, supporting cases, setting up local groups, forming coalitions, finding a way in whatever is me way is meaningful to them to make their voices heard. And you know, the amendment in the last immigration bill that sought to put a time limit on immigration detention, it didn't lose by that many votes. And of course, now the parliamentary arithmetic is much more finely balanced. And we know that there are conservative re rebels on this issue. Andrew Mitchell, I've mentioned, Caroline Spellman is another. And of course, they would be joining the very clear positions taken by both Labour and the Liberal Democrats and the Greens and others at previous elections that they want to put a 28-day time limit on immigration detention. Perhaps surprisingly as well, and again, another sign, but actually, you know, this is an issue that can really bring people with it. There is an early day motion at the moment um, in Parliament, and that early day motion calls for a time limit on immigration detention and it was laid by two members of the DUP. And you wouldn't necessarily think the DUP would be allies on this, but they, of course, come from a country where they really understand the damage that administrative internment can do. So I feel really proud to say that Liberty, this is our flagship campaign this year, ending indefinite detention. It's a long time coming, and I think it's only right that we step up to add our voice to this campaign. And, of course, we do it in the context of genuinely incredible work that has been done by many others over many years. We will have an opportunity later this year. We will have an immigration bill that will set out our post-Brexit immigration system. And that is an opportunity to lay an amendment for a time limit. And we have people on all sides of the political spectrum saying that they would be willing to put their name to that amendment. What is crucial is the pressure. In my job, one of the things that I learned, which is maybe obvious but I hadn't really thought about before, is that MPs, you know, they really care about whether they're going to get any votes. That I did figure out. But MPs will frequently say to you, if we get five letters on an issue, not such a big deal. If we get 50 letters on an issue, we listen. MPs in marginal seats probably listen to a fewer number of letters. So... What's really crucial, and where you come in and everyone you know comes in, is turning up the heat outside Westminster, because they do feel it. And so we've started with a very simple ask, which is a petition to gather signatures to demand that Amber Rudd puts a time limit in the bill. There will be many other actions that follow. It will ratchet up as the bill comes. And so sign that petition, keep in touch with us, keep in touch with the many organisations that are working on this issue. But do it from a place of optimism, because this genuinely is the year that this could change, and you owe it to the people in detention, and you owe it to the people who give their lives over to this kind of work, to also add your voice. And of course, from time to time, the stars do align, and amazing things do happen. The best example at the moment is 
the Me Too movement. And in the last year, from a position that I don't think anyone really predicted, we have seen, you know, we haven't solved it, but we have seen the patriarchy just start to wobble a little bit on its pedestal. And we see great campaigns in history that suddenly come together. You know, Rosa Parks was not the first person to refuse to give up her seat on a bus. And Martin Luther King had given his I Have a Dream speech twice before he gave it in Washington. But for whatever reason, the stars aligned and the wind blew in the right direction and something captured the public imagination, much bigger than any law could ever do or any bill in Parliament. And something changed and it could not be undone. And what I wish for is that that's what happens with migrants' rights in this country and everywhere over the next few years. And I think, of course, it will be a fight that, as David Foster Wallace said, demands attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able to truly care about other people. But I think in that fight, there is real hope and there is real freedom for people that are in those detention centres. And actually, there's real freedom for all of us. So please do go forth tonight with a little bit of optimism about this very important issue that, of course, was so close to Kay's heart and think that this might be the year that we finally see an end to this terrible abuse. Thank you. Uh, uh, a, one, well, a wonderful inaugural lecture, um, very moving indeed, and thank you very much. I, um, if anybody has any comments or questions, observations, Martha is very happy to engage, uh, to talk about the Liberty campaign. Um, or, or any of the issues that she's touched on. We do have, we do have uh, a roving mic or two, or two uh, being held by student ambassadors in SOAS T-shirts. LAUGHTER um, Matthew. Thank you. Um, that was a very moving speech. Thank you for that. I, I was just wondering, um, in recent legislation, they introduced something that people who uh, don't apply for bail will automatically be given a bail hearing. I think it's after four months. And then I heard that when you're taken into detention, you're asked to tick a box to say you opt out of getting your automatic bail hearing. So I just want to know what um, your view of that was and whether Liberty would be seeking to challenge that. Yeah, so we've also heard about this. Um, and, oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Um, we, we've also heard about this and so our initial investigations are that it's not, it doesn't happen, but others are saying that it is happening. Um, and Automatic bail hearings, I think, are really important, although I think unless you're also entitled to representation, they're very often meaningless for the people who need those hearings the most. Um, there was a case recently, the VC case, which is about the fact that there is no system whatsoever for people who lack capacity in detention. You, you don't get any help. There's no 
way of having a supported decision-making mechanism or anything, so for those people, a bail hearing is utterly meaningless. So yes, I think those kinds of automatic hearings, I think automatic judicial oversight is a really important part of the strategy. Um, we've kind of zeroed in on the time limit issue um, because ultimately, I think our fear is that judicial oversight is important, but you know we've all done bail hearings like the bail hearing I did, and so it's not the perfect answer. In the same way that you know another angle that some groups have kind of run with in the past is about detention of vulnerable groups and an attempt to sort of say, well, let's commit to not detaining children or pregnant women or victims of trafficking and torture. Um, and again, our view is that you know those are the easy cases that get picked off, and actually you have to do the kind of tanks on the lawn time limit for everybody, and if you don't have that, you're never going to have a just system. There's a lady there. Oh, oh you're here. Hi, Martha. <laughs> Didn't I'm Alison Pickup. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned bid when you mentioned me. You mentioned bid a few times. I'm, I don't know if anyone's here from bid, but I'm just going to do a plug on their behalf, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, they are currently fr um, crowdfunding for a case against G well against the government for failing to designate G4S as a high risk strategic supplier in the light in the wake particularly of that Panorama documentary about uh, Brookhouse. Um, so uh, they've raised. £9,855 out of their needed £11,000. So this is just a, a plug. Please support their campaign. It's the most brilliant idea to hold the government to account for failing to hold G4S to account. Um, so if you Google, what do we Google? Bid G4S Crowd Justice, you'll find the site. Great, do it. Um, hi, I'm Nina. I work at Wilson Solicitors and I was supervised by Kay. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk. I feel really optimistic after listening to it and it's really nice to feel optimistic about the work that we do. Um, I just uh, worry about the risk of compromise in the campaign. Um, I'm thinking of um, the risk that, for example, foreign national offenders might be excluded from a time limit, or that 28 days risks becoming the norm um, so that everybody's detained for 28 days, no matter what, or that maybe we end up with a time limit that's longer than 28 days, for example, six months, which I understand is quite normal in other areas of Europe. And I was wondering what Liberty is going to do strategically to avoid those compromises. Yeah. So I think all of those compromises or unintended consequences are really realistic risks and there are more. So I think the other risk that we think about is that you'll see a lot more deportations, um, that they'll really push things like deport first and appeal later. Um, ultimately, with all these campaigns across all areas, compromise looms from the very beginning and unintended consequences are unavoidable. So our position is that we won't compromise. We would never say, OK, thanks very much, we'll take six months and do a sort of deal or whatever. Um, although, of course, that's easy because we don't have to. You know, we, it's, not, it's not difficult. We're not the politicians. Um, and it's not to say that some of the people who currently are our allies in Parliament wouldn't make those compromises and let us down for whatever reason. Um, so... You know, we're doing all the things you'd expect strategically. We're doing very careful message testing. We've got a whole bank of really persuasive stories. We are being really clear when we talk to people like Andrew Mitchell that this is a kind of all or nothing situation. He's very persuaded by the fact 28 days is the same as the terror suspect limit. So I think there's, there's kind of good narratives around all these things. We've worked out messages that play well with different audiences. You know, we've got a pretty united cross-faith group speaking on this. So there's lots of things that you can do to shore up the arguments. I think ultimately you then just take the plunge because I do think often change is incremental and while I would never advocate for 28 days becoming the norm or more deportations, I think you have to start from the point of principle of saying we have to end indefinite detention. Time and again we're told by people who've been in detention that it's, it's indefinite nature 
that is the most destructive. And so we try and deal with that problem, and then there will be the unintended consequences, and then we try and deal with those. Um, and otherwise, I think the problem is you get paralysis because you can't move any which way without fear of something happening. And, the, and they will come back with something. Of course they will. Um, but that's the next fight. There's a gentleman at the front. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for your excellent uh, talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, indefinite uh, immigration detention is, uh, or you argued that it is uh, policy driven, and obviously no one can deny that. But I wonder to what extent you also think it's, it's driven by economic interest, because we, we've heard about the role of G4S. There's a number of uh, private providers they are profiting from the system. Um, so my question is, A, um, what role uh, uh, do they play in sustaining the system as it is? What role do you expect them to play? I mean, the answer seems to be pretty obvious in, in your campaign. And what is, what is your advocacy on, on dealing with that aspect of the indefinite uh, immigration detention system? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a very good question. And... I think there's no doubt that although the genesis was policy and law and politics, of course, when you then create a system, you know, it's the old too big to fail adage. Um, and there is now a whole system and there's a lot of jobs that rely on it and a lot of profit, although I think probably less profit than they originally aspired to, um, in the same way that you see with the privatised part of the prison estate. So you are then dealing with the corporate structure and... So one aspect of the strategy is to look at the kind of corruption angles that are often quite effective and quite disruptive for those corporate um, power structures. Ultimately, liberties advocacy tends to be directed at government and at state bodies. So as part of this campaign, we do have a strand which is kind of about corporate power and corrupt corporate power. But what we're actually trying to do, because I don't think we are the most well-placed to to be the ones doing that advocacy, because we don't, we don't really interface with corporations very much, is we're talking to other NGOs who work much more on corporate power, particularly in the environmental sector, um, to try and get them to push that angle in a way that we otherwise couldn't. And those organisations, you know, people like Global Witness, they have uh, teams of investigators that are used to trying to deal with these big beasts like G4S. And so the hope is that as the campaign gets going, um, and you know, very often with these campaigns, wins get wins, and so as more people want to become involved, we hope that that corporate angle will take off a little bit more. And, and yeah, the answer to your second question about what, what role do they play in the debate behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, of course, they're lobbying for their continued existence, I would have thought. There's a, there's a hand up uh, just behind you Oh, thank you. My name's Miranda. I work for Hackney Community Law Centre and Haringey Law Centre. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Yarl's Wood. Um, I saw that your predecessor, Shami, um, finally got in with Diane Abbott last week. Um, and on a personal level, my mum is a storyteller and a poet and a singer, and she's been asked to come in um, and do poetry and song and writing with the women in Yarl's Wood. Um, and I'm just wondering, what's going on after they wouldn't let anybody in and now they're letting in politicians and poets and storytellers. Is it campaigning? Is this a permanent change? From what you know is going on, why are they suddenly opening up? Yeah, so we've also noticed the change. So Andrew Mitchell in December wrote saying that he wanted to do a visit to Brooke House, didn't hear, didn't hear, and then got this letter that I quoted from, from Amber Rudd authorising him to go. Um, bear in mind, no Home Secretary has ever been to a detention centre. I mean, again, an indication. The idea you'd have a justice minister who had never been to a prison is unthinkable. Um, so no sign that Amber Rudd is going to go to the Earlswood or anywhere. But I think, you know, my hopeful take on it, and I don't have intelligence to suggest that it's right or wrong, is that there is a sense that you cannot keep denying access in the way... Because if you can access prisons, which you can what is the justification for not being able to access removal centres? Um, and I think when you have high-profile people like Diane Abbott or Shami or Andrew Mitchell saying, we want to go, do you really want to be putting in black and white that you're going to deny them a visit? I just don't think you can. I don't think it's politically feasible. Um, 
somewhere at the back. The man there. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I had up at, right at the back, uh, just to delete the <laughs> videos. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, yeah, it was very memorable um, and uh, very enlightening. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm a journalist by trade. Uh, I'm just quite interested uh, in terms of raising awareness. Obviously, I think you highlighted that not a lot of people are aware of indefinite detention. Uh, but my question really is, how can we make people care more about it? Because the, the the reality is that there are a lot of big issues like tax avoidance on Panama Papers, and um, that exposed a lot of injustices, but people kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, so what? Yeah. So when it comes to things like indefinite detention, what can we do to make people care more if we can't appeal to people's basic humanity? I mean, what message can we really hit home to make people care about this issue, which is a very important one? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's quite easy to feel, as you say, as the you know, Panama Papers and Paradise Papers roll and, or, you know, go back further and nobody seems to really mind about what Edward Snowden reveals. You know, there's lots of kind of big moments where you can hang your head and think we live in a bit of an apathetic nation. Um, I think the really, the, the real potential with immigration detention as an issue, at least to start with, is that there are whole parts of the base that don't know about it. And when they find out about it, they feel very passionately about it. And... I'm not sure that you do need to persuade the whole population that it's bad, and I don't think you would, even if you tried, and you certainly wouldn't if you're just the NGO sector or just the Guardian or just the BBC. Um, but actually what we find time and again is that people who are inclined to support issues like that just haven't heard of it. And so, in fact, getting coverage in places like... You know, for many of Liberty's issues, we don't really... It's, you know, the Guardian are amazing, but we don't, like, chalk that up as a win when they cover something that we work on because we know that their readership are supportive of it and we're not, we're not winning any hearts and minds. Actually, on immigration detention, the research suggests that when, you, when the usual suspects cover it, people do change their mind because they just didn't know about it in the first place. So that, I think, is a kind of... That's where the hopefulness comes in with, with raising awareness on this issue. And I think it's a good place to start because trying to convert everyone is impossible. So start with the activist base that you might be able to make do something in the next 12 months and then hope that it spreads from there. Um, and then there, you know, so some of the messaging work that we've done has been around how to engage young people. Um, and there's lots, interestingly, there's lots about, you know, how to make an emotional connection. And much of that has focused on this idea of waiting. So if anyone's seen the, the sort of Liberty campaign graphics and stuff, all of that is around this idea of departure boards and indefinite delay. Um, and it's because lots of the research was that young people have a really visceral understanding of how painful it is to wait for anything, like even when a YouTube video, <laughs> yeah. So they, they hate it when YouTube buffers and they hate it when a train is delayed by like two minutes. And if you can tap that sense of, I can't even bear to wait for the YouTube video to load. And then in that moment, say, imagine if it was your liberty, you know, whatever. Um, then that so far has played quite, it's not how my brain works, but we worked with some creative people um, and we got some funding to do some focus group work and some message testing and that was some very interesting feedback which we're now trusting and, and experimenting with. And so I think, again, you know, the sector can learn to be a bit braver about how it approaches some of these issues. So there, there are still some, um, there's some, there's lots of hands going up. Um, <laughs> Should we another couple? Sure, are, you, are you quite happy? I'm to? happy. <laughs> uh, so um, the, there's a there's a gentleman. Um, He's been waiting quite a long time. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. The question I wanted to ask was the new rules with regard to bail. Uh, they are making it as the obvious route, once somebody's got bail, they no longer come under the judiciary, they are handed over to the Home Office. Mm. Well, I have assiduously asked each and every time, quite recently, um, for that not to happen. And I am asked why, and on the whole, I've got my way. What do you think about it? Am I being needlessly um, suspicious? I mean, I'm always suspicious. 
So just, just, just being suspicious is a good thing in my book, but um, just so I understand, do you mean that there should be judicial supervision then of the person that has been... Yes, once you've got bail, they get, you get transferred yeah. to the Home Office unless you object yeah. and the judge agrees that it stays with the, with the judiciary. Yeah, yeah. So, like I say, no, I don't think you're being <laughs> suspicious. Um, and yes, I think the more judicial scrutiny, I mean, fundamentally what I think is that the more independent scrutiny of home office decision making and home office operations, the better. And so whether that is a judge or some other mechanism, you know, fine. Um, but yes, I think there's every reason to seek that scrutiny and not least because, you know, I talked about the hostile environment policies. I talked about the way that people are then going to be treated. You know, we know the story with bail accommodation. It's not as though the moment that you are released from detention on bail, life becomes rosy um, and you are as vulnerable to abuse and to being re-detained when you are in those moments after, after leaving detention as you probably are just before you leave detention. So, yes, I think it sounds like you're fighting a good and important fight on that one. So you've got an impossible job. It's so easy for us to see, and it's just not. Hey. Um, hi, uh, my name's Simon Cox. I used to be an immigration barrister in the UK, and I work uh, in some other countries now, doing some similar work. Um, thank you, Martha. That was a fantastic speech, uh, and it's great uh, for those of us with an interest in migrants' rights to see that Liberty has uh, taken up this issue. Um, I just wanted to mention for the uh, sister on the other side of the room who just spoke about the uh, new bail rules. Uh, I spent eight years on the Tribunal Procedures Committee, uh, and certainly it's very worrying uh, that the um, Home Office and some judges feel that the default position should be that power is transferred to the Home Office to supervise where bail is granted, in particular because it means that the remedy is judicial review and not going back to uh, a regular immigration judge. And while judicial review judges may be better, um, they take legal aid and they take solicitors to get to them. Uh, and I think that the Home Office is trying to put uh, relatively accessible justice out of reach um, for people who are, are, are being handed to their system. And judges who don't want to be dealing with bail cases uh, are, are, are maybe going along with it. So it's great to hear that you're opposing it. Um, I had two uh, thoughts, really. Uh, the first was, um, it's very expensive. It's £100 a day to keep people in detention. Uh, and you mentioned the... Um, the Article 3 cases, they're very expensive. A lot of money going to Wilson's, a lot of money going to Bat Murphy, a lot of money going to Garden Court and Doughty Street. Um, and all of that money that's going into G4S and the legal aid uh, uh, community could have gone to Northampton County Council for elderly care. Uh, could have gone for all other kinds of uh, things that uh, uh, the government says it says matters, but actually gives a, a, a blank check to the Home Office. Um, and I think the bigger piece here, which I don't think is Liberty's fight, though it would be great to have you in it, it's all of our fight, uh, is that the detention system is only one part of a, a broken immigration system. Broken for a very small number of people. I mean, the vast majority of us cross borders easily. Um, but uh, for a small number, it's really broken. And it's broken, I think, deliberately, uh, because officials don't want to make fair, quick decisions, because if they made fair, quick decisions, they'd be letting a lot more people stay. Mm -hmm. uh, and because Theresa May set targets with no means of meeting them. And so instead of being able to apply the law, they look around for reasons to refuse. And one of their key tools is intimidating people out of the country by detaining them uh, indefinitely. So I think that um, shrinking the detention estate most drastically with the 28-day cut. But the measure, it seems to be the message to people like Andrew Mitchell is, if you want a f working immigration system for after Brexit, then get your job done within 28 days. Yeah. It's not that hard. Yeah. And that needs a massive culture change in the Home Office because the number of competent people in the Home Office... Um, <laughs> well, it's certainly smaller than this lecture theatre. Uh, um, and it's a, it's a department that's full of people who are incompetent or malign, or both. So when Julie Anderson gets up and she's racist, she does that because that's what her clients like. They didn't fire her for that, yeah? She, she wasn't speaking for herself. She's speaking for Theresa May and the immigration officer who's sitting right behind her. Um, so I think that we also therefore need as a community to be clearing out the Home Office, because we need staff who 
want to serve the community in an efficient way, want to make realistic migration decisions, and do it within a reasonable budget. And at the moment, we don't have those people uh, running the country's immigration service on behalf of Theresa May. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine many people in the room disagree with you. I think it's, <laughs> it's right that one of the reasons why I kind of, whenever I'm talking about detention, I try and talk about immigration enforcement generally is because I do think detention is only one part of the picture and we all need to be clued up enough and engaged enough to talk about those other parts of it. Um, I think the economic argument is an important one. You know, we don't know the compensation... Um, figures, the recent ones, but in 2010 to 2014, compensation alone, so not the £100 a day, was £15 million. Um, so that's big numbers. The problem is that economic arguments as an, a campaign strategy don't play. Um, and so the reason that they're not front and centre of Liberty's campaign and they're not front and centre of the detention forums campaigning is because, you know, we know from Brexit people don't really hear it, don't really care, and are happy for the trade-off to be it's expensive, but we don't like immigrants, so it's fine. Um, so that's why I think you don't see those things front and centre. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's... They know that the Home Office is in trouble because when the Home Office has to start, as well as doing what it's currently doing, also managing EU migration, you know, that in government they know it's going to break. And they are trying to design systems... You know, even the system they're trying to design about regularising the EU nationals that are here is this mad online system that is, you know, you can just... It's full of data protection breaches already, and they haven't even launched it. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. Um, and so I think there is a little opening for that conversation with the politicians because they are aware that the Home Office is not fit for purpose post-Brexit. And so that does give us some space to talk about what a fit for purpose Home Office might look like. Um, but obviously, you know, as you say, you're swimming against the ideology of the people at the top at the moment. Thank you, thank you very much indeed for all, all those questions and comments. Uh, I'm now going to ask Carol to conclude proceedings. I like having the last word. <laughs> so even though it's late in the, in the day, uh, late in these proceedings, welcome to SOAS particularly if this is your first visit to SOAS. Our welcome is as warm as the day is cold. <laughs> so, I first heard of Kay Everett in November 2016 when I was contacted by Wilsons and when Michael Hanley visited SOAS shortly thereafter to discuss how we might be involved, my colleague Dr. Catherine Jenkins was sitting up there uh, and I were both struck and really left with the impression of a deep loss to Wilson's of a respected colleague and a well-loved colleague. Hearing about Kay's work, uh, she and I felt that it was entirely appropriate that SOAS Law School worked with Wilson's to remember Kay. Kay's work and that of Wilson's is very SOAS-y. So many of our postgraduate students are enrolled on the same LLM that Kay was enrolled on, or on the similar MA program on human rights. Students of these programs, along with those enrolled on other programs, are likely to take the module on international protection of human rights, I have to say that because Lutz is here today, and, and that on refugee and migration law, Clara and Lutz are here, uh, human rights of women, Islamic law and human rights, and other modules that look at particular moments of social and political change in which human rights loom large. Some of our students are also members of a clinic course on human rights through which they are engaged in research for partner NGOs. So it's absolutely the right place um, for this memorial lecture. Um, I've spent the evening also thinking about a former student of mine called Claire, who was an immigration lawyer up in Scotland, but she gave up that work for, um, to be an LLM student for a year. And one day I saw her dragging along, well, not dragging along, uh, carrying what was obviously a large but empty suitcase. Uh, and I asked her about it, and she said, well, I'm lugging this around because this evening I'm going to a detention center. And the person I've been visiting there 
is probably going to be deported and she will need the suitcase. So I think you will find at SOAS uh, some students who are ready to uh, sign petitions and write letters to their MPs. Nearly 80 of our LLB or BA law students are taking the Foundations of Human Rights Law class and nearly 30 of our students are studying asylum and immigration law, a module that gives them some practical experience working with those who've become snarled up in the asylum and immigration system. Human rights and access to justice are in fact present in much of our teaching and not just in the specific modules that I've mentioned. It is also present in the research agendas of many of my colleagues, whether they are looking at transitional justice, Islamic law, Chinese law, social change, and law and society, criminal justice, issues to do with land, climate change, or migrant workers. It's therefore gratifying to see those early plans discussed with Michael come to fruition this evening. Uh, and, and I don't have much more to say, uh, you'll be pleased to hear, because I, I realize that I stand between you and refreshments. So, <laughs> so I will draw this inaugural lecture and prize giving to a close by first congratulating our prize winner, Ada. Um, secondly, by thanking Christine Jumper, whom I think is hiding somewhere by the door. Uh, who's, whose hard work is behind the success of this evening. Um, and finally, I would like to thank our inaugural K. Everett Memorial Lecturer, Martha Spurrier. Finally, I would like to thank Michael for giving so us this wonderful opportunity to remember an alumna and to inspire our students at the same time. I've asked um, Michelle Massey, who's seated there, QC, one of our school, uh, one of the School of Law's senior fellows, to present a token of the School of Law's appreciation to both Martha and uh, Michael. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michelle, and lastly, thank you very much uh, to you all for supporting this event. Drinks are but a floor, uh, a flight of steps away up there. Thank you.